Cautious optimism, that was the tone of the Fed's minutes. They also talked about varying their asset purchases, which sent a bit of a shockwave through the financial markets on Wednesday. Joining me now is Nuriel Rubini, NYU professor and chairman of Rubini Global Economics. Uh, Nuriel, first of all, what is your take on the state of the U.S. economy right now? Well, the economy is recovering, but I expect another year of a subpar below trend economic growth. The positive, as we know, is some recovery of housing, the shale, gas, and oil revolution. The fact that there is some job creation, some reshoring manufacturing, and the effects of QE3. Right, so the growth, but subpar growth. Subpar growth, especially because those are the positives. The biggest negative is that the mini deal was reached on the fiscal cliff in general. It already implies $240 billion of adjustment on the fiscal side. Right. We believe that actually we're going to go into a sequester. You do. So the fiscal drag could be something like closer to 2% of GDP. So since the economy has been growing barely 2% for the last few quarters, if you subtract almost 2% of growth, you're down to zero. Then you add growth because of jobs, shale, housing, and QE3. And we get growth of 1.6% this year. This is mediocre. It's below trend. It's also below consensus in our view. Right. So, so the economy is going to remain weak. So you do think we're going to hit, we're going to, hit the sequester? Yes, and, uh, absolutely. Ha have, the, have the markets prepared for that at this point? Or are they expecting there's going to be some last-minute deal like we had on the fiscal cliff? Well, it doesn't look like there's going to be a last-minute deal on the sequester. I think both sides are going to go into the sequester. The question is going to be how long the sequester is going to last. I think the markets are a little bit blasé about right. the effects of the sequester because the two sides are so divergent about it. And the Republican strategy right now is the following one. They've said... We're not going to let the Democrats accuse us of destroying the debt rating of the U.S. Therefore, we're going to postpone the debt ceiling by three months. We're not going to let them accuse us of shutting down the government. So when the CR is going to come March 27th, then they're going to extend it to the current That's level. That's the continuing resolution. Right? So they, they resolution, can shut down right? the government on March But they're not going to do right? it. They're not going to do the debt ceiling. So they're going to concentrate on the sequester. Now, the sequester is painful for them. But in this game of chicken between them and the Democrats, at the time of the fiscal cliff, all the bargaining power was on the Democrats because the automatic stuff was the tax increases. Right. This time around, the automatic stuff is the spending cuts. Now, some of the spending cuts are painful to the Republicans, because half of it is defense, but they believe that actually, if they stick with that, they can force Democrats to accept entitlement reform, more spending right. cuts, and so and on. And I think most Americans right now say we need to cut government spending, so they would, I think the Republicans rightly feel that they have, generally speaking, supported the American people on that. Uh, they do, even if then uh, the Democrats have the support of the American people on maintaining social security, right. maintaining Medicare, and so on. And I think the two sides are going to butt heads. It's going to be a game of chicken. The risk is that actually sequester continues for many months. The fiscal drag additionally is another 0.7, 0.8% of the economy. Therefore, you're already having slow economic growth. You have another shock. It could have also have effects on financial markets, maybe a correction of the stock market. Okay, so the rating yeah. agency is saying, you guys are in total gridlock. Maybe we're going to downgrade you. So I think people are underestimating how much the fight of the sequester might have both economic and financial effects that are negative. Okay, so yeah, so you say the markets are too blasé about yeah. this particular issue. Are they too blasé? Generally, we're on the cusp of new all-time highs. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like the markets are thinking... And maybe it's just because what the Fed is doing, but the markets seem to think the global economy, not just the U.S. economy, is in recovery mode and it's sustainable. Well, certainly compared to a year ago, the tail risk of a Eurozone breakups are lower. The tail risk of Italy and Spain losing market access are lower. The tail risk of a U.S. Uh, falling off the cliff or having a... Um, a collapse is lower, the risk of a hard landing of China is lower, the risk of a war between Israel and Iran are lower. And what markets are pricing in are, first of all, tail risk are lower. But look at the Q4. In the major economies of the world, U.S. economic growth negative, U.K. negative, Japan negative, Eurozone is negative. So the question is why the markets are going up. Is because the economy is growing? No, economic growth is still very anemic, subpar. Yes, there is some improvement in the forward-looking variable, but we have another dose of monetary stimulus, right. more unconventional monetary policy by the ECB, by the Fed, by the BOJ, by the BOE, by the Swiss National Bank. And the fiscal contraction, by the way, this year is not just in the periphery of Eurozone and UK. Core of the Eurozone has to do it, US has to do it. And the IMF has shown that when you have synchronized fiscal consolidation, the negative effects on economic growth are worse. So we start with low growth, with tail risk, with the fiscal consolidation, and what saves the day is another bout of liquidity chasing right. for So, so that's why when the Fed minutes say that, that the committee, quote, should be prepared to vary the pace of asset purchases, people start to think, huh, maybe they might pull back on their buying they're doing of treasuries <coughs> and mortgage-backed securities. You've said that you yeah. think the quantitative easing program is, quote, misguided. Should they be doing more? Should they be doing less? What, what is your take on that? Well, m my view is that actually, uh, since the economy is going to remain weak, since we're going to have low inflation below target, probably the current pace 
of QE is necessary and may even continue for a while. But what's come out recently from the minutes of the Fed is that within the FOMC, there is an increasing number of members of it that are quite vocal about the negative effects of continued QE. Right. So for example, uh, Jeremy Stein wrote a speech about saying all this QE might lead to a credit and asset bubble. That's dangerous. The markets, on uh, right when the minutes come out, they go down almost 1%. Right. That says how much of the lift off of the market of that asset reflation is injection of liquidity as opposed to strong economic growth. If you have a 1% correction just because the minutes say some people might want to phase out the QE slightly earlier than otherwise, it's a signal of how much liquidity is really lifting asset prices.